All right, so if you followed along with the last screencast that I made on just looking at basic types of stoichiometry problems, one thing that you may have noticed in the wording of those problems was that one of the reactants was always mentioned as being in excess. So this screencast is going to help us to be a little more analytical with types of stoichiometry problems where instead of seeing a situation where we have a numerical amount of one reactant and an excess of the other, where we're just presented with two amounts of reactants and we have to figure out, well, which one of them is actually going to be used up or do they happen to be in stoichiometric proportion where they would both be consumed? This is really the study of limiting reactants where we have a given amount of one reactant and a given amount of another, and we have to make a prediction. Well, if we know what the products are, how much of the products will actually form, and which of the, of the reactants will be left over, and how much. So let's just take a, a little bit of a backtrack into what we should already know at this point. A key fundamental idea of all stoichiometry is that we have to rely upon balanced chemical equations to tell us the proportionality of a reaction. So just to break that down in, in regards to this particular equation shown here, uh, you see these little molecules, these are hydrogen molecules. And the molecules here in blue, those are nitrogen molecules. And they react together under certain conditions, high pressure and uh, relatively high temperature, to make Ammonia. Ammonia has the chemical formula NH3. So you notice a certain proportionality here. Three hydrogen molecules, one nitrogen molecule will react to produce two ammonia molecules. Now we can symbolically represent this as follows. Three H2, because remember the coefficients tell us how many, react with one nitrogen. And notice when there's only one, we don't put the coefficient in front. It's assumed. React to form two ammonia molecules. Okay, so we see this 3 to 1 to 2 proportion as we've written it based upon this visual equation that we see in front of us. So this 3 to 1 to 2 proportionality is going to define all of the reacting chemistry for the stoichiometric analysis that we might have to do regarding the synthesis of ammonia. So let's look at a, a problem that's a little bit more of a thought process in terms of using this equation in context. So we've seen this equation, we just talked about it, so we'll write it again. So here we're just going to write the reactants in a different order. So we have nitrogen plus three hydrogen reacting to form two ammonia. Okay. And then if we look at the question that's being asked of us, the question says, well, how much ammonia can be formed from the starting amounts of hydrogen and nitrogen shown in the box below? So remember that hydrogen is this particular molecule and nitrogen is this. Now what I find is helpful for me is to pay attention to the proportionality of the reactants, which in this case, there's a one here, okay? So for every one nitrogen, it reacts with three hydrogens. And remember, this proportionality can be used in terms of particles, or it could also be used in terms of moles. And when we study gases, we'll learn that we can also treat these this proportionality by volumes of gas, assuming that standard temperature, or as, assuming that the gases are at the same temperature and pressure. So here's how I, I work through this. So I know that for every one nitrogen, I'm going to need to react with three hydrogens. So if, if I cross out one nitrogen, I know that that's going to react with three times as much hydrogen. So that's going to produce two ammonia, okay? And here on this, I can actually copy and paste these particular molecules in. So I know that that would make one, two. So, so far I've used up those and I've produced two. Now I still have some left over, so let's continue the crossing out process. So this nitrogen will react with three additional hydrogens and that gives me two more ammonia. So I can just quickly drop those into my image. So now I've got four. Now if I look, I haven't used up everything. At this point I've used up all the nitrogen, but notice that there's still a hydrogen that's left over, but there's no more nitrogen to react with it. So what I have to recognize is that hydrogen is in excess. It's, there's nothing, there's no possible way for it to react because there's no nitrogen to react with it. 
So in this case, that tells us something. It tells us nitrogen is completely consumed, and that's our limiting reactant, and hydrogen has some leftovers, and that's our excess reactant. So we can take one of those and put it into our mix at the end. So visually, if we wanted to do a quick visual analysis of what we started with compared to what we end up with, the reacting ratio is always proportional to the balanced equation, this 1 to 3 proportion. Any leftover reactants will still be present after the reaction has gone as far as it can. So in this case, we don't completely have an opportunity to use up all the hydrogen, but we do use up all of the nitrogen. This is the basic analytical thought process that you need to go through for limiting reactant type problems. And notice how we can identify these types of problems. They are situations where we are provided with starting amounts of both reactants. Notice it didn't tell us which reactant was in excess. We actually had to think it through and figure it out for ourselves. That also required us to be able to write a balanced chemical equation and use that proportionality to solve the problem. So mathematically, the way that this will show up will be something like the next problem that we're going to work on together. So take a look. Notice that we have a problem here where we have numerical values now, which we had previously seen as symbolic uh, or as visual molecules. And so we have a flask that's got five moles of nitrogen gas and six moles of hydrogen gas. And it asks us, well, how much ammonia could we form? How much ammonia in moles? So a helpful tool for analyzing at this point is something called a BCA table. And a BCA table, we practiced it in class, but it helps us to organize what we start with, how things change, and what we end up with at the end of everything. So I'm just going to fill it out, remembering that the only values that I can ever put into a BCA table are amounts in moles. So before, let's see, we had five moles of nitrogen gas and we had six moles of hydrogen, and before the reaction happens, of course, we would have zero ammonia. Now, at this point, these numbers are nice. We can actually see that five to six, this five and the six, that's not in a one to three proportion. That means that one of these reactants is going to be completely used up and one is going to be left over. The quickest way that I can tell you to identify the limiting reactant is to take the starting amount, the before amount, and divide it by the coefficient in front of that particular material. And the, and the value that is the smallest, that's the one that's going to be the limiting reactant. So if I do that just kind of here in, in pink, this, or sorry, red, this would be 5 over 1, okay? Because 5 is the amount we have, 1 is the coefficient in front of nitrogen. Doing that same process here, we would have 6 over 3. So just from this analysis here in red, we can see that hydrogen is going to be our limiting reactant, which means all 6 moles is going to be used up. So in terms of a change, we can write that as minus 6, because if we start with 6 and it's the limiting reactant, it's going to be completely consumed and we're not going to have any left afterwards. Now for nitrogen, however, it's going to react in a three to 1 to 3 ratio with hydrogen. So 1 third of this 6 moles, or 2 moles, will of the nitrogen gas will react. So again, the change is always proportional to the coefficients in front of the balanced chemical equation. So the change should always be in a 1 to 3 ratio in this particular type of problem, which means after the reaction is all done, we're still going to have 3 moles of nitrogen left over. Now if we apply that same technique to figuring out how much ammonia is actually left, because that's really the crux of the problem, right? We notice that things should be proportional. So I think the easiest part for me is just to compare nitrogen and ammonia, which is in a 1 to 2 proportion. So I'm going to get twice as much ammonia to form. So if I used up 2 moles of nitrogen, that means 4 moles of ammonia will form. And that means once everything's all said and done, I would have 4 moles of ammonia that would be produced. Okay. So a BCA table can help us organize this information, and what we need to remember to do is at the end, once we've, once we've done our analysis, we have to pull out that piece of information that matters. So based upon our little analysis here, we could say 4 moles 
of ammonia form. Now there are harder versions of problems that require the same type of analysis. So let's look at one that's a little, little bit more difficult. Here again, we're gonna use the same equation just for familiarity. We're taking nitrogen and hydrogen and reacting to make ammonia. But this time we're given amounts, not in moles, but in grams. So we have five grams of nitrogen gas and six grams of hydrogen gas. Now the fundamental question is still the same. What's the maximum amount of ammonia in grams that can form? So we're really accomplishing the same goal except starting with masses instead. And if you think about it, that's pretty common to do in a chem lab, right? You would be measuring out amounts in grams and seeing how much product you could produce in grams. So the first step we have to do is convert from grams into moles. Now this was a strategy that we employed in, in the basic stoichiometry screencast. So we have to remember that nitrogen gas is diatomic, so the work for converting from grams to moles would look something like this. We start with five grams of ammonia, or sorry, nitrogen, and then we convert it into moles using the molar mass, which is 28 grams for one mole of nitrogen. And when we do our work here, we get around 0.179 moles. That's a value that can go into our table, 0.179. We do the same process for the amount of hydrogen gas. Notice up above it tells us six grams of hydrogen gas, so we should show that work for that conversion. Six grams of hydrogen. The molar mass of hydrogen gas is two because it's diatomic as well, so twice its atomic mass. And we get around three moles of hydrogen. So we can put it into our table, three moles. Remember all the values here are in moles. And initially we would have zero ammonia. Now if we apply the same strategy as what we applied before, taking this ratio here in red, we can see that, well this will give us 0.179 divided by 1, so that's 0.179, and this gives us 3 over 3, so that's 1. In this case, the limiting reactant is not hydrogen, the limiting reactant is going to be nitrogen. So we know, based upon the limiting reactant, that all of the limiting reactant gets used up. And we also know that there's a 1 to 3 proportion. So we can just multiply 0.179 times 3 to be able to figure out the amount of hydrogen that's used up. And when you do that, you get 0.537 moles. From there, we see that afterwards, there is no nitrogen that remains and there is 2.46 moles of hydrogen that remain, and the amount of ammonia that forms, twice the amount of nitrogen, so that would be 0.358, and then that means after everything's said and done, you have 0 0.358 moles of ammonia. Now, go back to the problem, Notice the problem asks us to find the amount of ammonia in grams. So our final step is going to be to take this amount of ammonia, which is in moles, and then convert it into grams. So let me show you what that would look like. All right, so I'll just show this here in purple. We have 0.385 moles of ammonia, and we're just going to use the molar mass of ammonia to convert it back into grams. This is just really a dimensional problem, dimensional analysis problem at this point. So one mole of ammonia, and then the molar mass of ammonia is 17 grams. We multiply through, and we get 6.09 grams of ammonia. So a couple of key takeaways at this point. 
BCA tables are going to be useful for us to use when we're trying to figure out what the limiting reactant is, as well as figure out how much product can form. And it can also be used for novel situations where you have an amount of product and you want to work backwards to figure out amounts of reactants that may have been involved. So they're pretty useful and you'll find them helpful when we get to equilibrium as well because we'll use a similar strategy for solving those types of problems. But anyhow, hope this uh, video on limiting, reactant was limiting reactants was helpful for you. Have a great, great day.